And uh, moving on to number two, how is right. blockchain superior to traditional financial uh, met- methods for startups like banking and stuff like that? Right. So as for the traditional financing method, um, basically people go to investors. Right. Right. And if I want to start a project, I either go to investors for them to invest in my startup or I go to the banks to borrow money. Or when, uh, when as a small and medium enterprises, when I encounter cash, mm. uh, when I encounter cash shortly, I go to the banks for borrowing as well. All right. So what blockchain has fundamentally changed is that uh, I have now I have a wider reach. Why I didn't want to go to the public for money is because I cannot go to all of them at the same time. I must approach one at a time, and that is very time consuming. The same for startups who have an idea but have no money, right? I can go to a lot of public, general public. I can ask my mom. I can ask people or my friend. The thing is, it's very hard to raise money that way. It's not efficient. What blockchain has solved is about the efficiency issue. If we look at the ICO space right now, uh, recently, a banker has completed his ICO, right? And they have raised 153 million in just three hours. That is some kind of financing record we have never seen before. And so with kind, that kind of reach, startups don't have to go to institution for financing. They can go to the public. And me, who, and, and this is also good on the other side for the general public who had no ways of investing in startups because of efficiency mismatch, the efficiency issues. So right now, I can invest in things I want, including putting money in the bank. So I think that is a much better model for both uh, people who deposit money in the bank, but it's also for um, uh, startups who need the money. So that and, is my And why is this relevant? So I think uh, this is relevant in um, the larger context of what we're trying to, uh, the uh, world trends. So if you see the um, sharing economy model that has been taking place right now, what we observe, it is not really sharing model. It is still a centralized model. It's called internet enabled centralized model. So they have a wider reach, but fundamentally they, ha- they are still sitting in the center charging a very high commission fee. The whole thing is not as distributed, it's not as uh, 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 decentralized as it should be. What the, uh, that is what the blockchain promises and what the blockchain wants the world to achieve. So what I mean is that individual players who are in the maybe Airbnb or Uber network do not really have the power to switch and do not really have the power to take their past transactions onto somewhere else and to demonstrate to others that they have the uh, history of uh, uh, taking passengers. So Airbnb or Uber, those centralized agencies are still controlling those transactions, are those still controlling those transactional data. Whereas if we move everything onto the blockchain, individual participants in the network, say Athe United, or be some other Uber equivalent on the blockchain network, will have much greater control when it comes to what they own, like information or how they want to switch the exit option, the exit cost is much lower. So I think that is one of the advantage of uh, using blockchain. And another thing is that uh, right now in a world with uh, the very, uh, intense robotization and automation, a lot of people are not, uh, um, the job prospect is not very good. In actual fact, a lot of jobs are in peril because they are replaced by robots. And in this case, the ideal situation is that people own uh, part of what he's going to consume and people own part of what he's going to produce. So we are all individual producers and we are all individual sellers and we are entitled to what we have. And we have a steady stream of income from the factors of production that we own. So I think that is ideal situation we are trying to achieve. And we can only get there with the use of blockchain, with the issuance of tokens and stuff like that. So I have a stake in whatever I have. I have a, like somebody else have a stake in my things as well. So everything is delineated and everything is decentralized. I do not have to rely on a centralized agency to do this because it would be going to be very messy if I'm going to have some centralized agency engage in this business because there's a lot of accounting to do and stuff like that. Whereas blockchain, by its very nature, solves, it, it solves this issue uh, seamlessly. So that's my take on it. 
Cool. And um, are there any drawbacks to blockchain? You say a lot of good things, but. Yeah, certainly there will be drawbacks to anything. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so first of all, uh, there are a lot of high profile hacking cases recently, uh, especially, so this can be seen in many uh, ways. So first of all, uh, some of the exchanges in the past are hacked and a lot of Bitcoins are stolen. And we all know that uh, reversibility about Bitcoin. So once the Bitcoins are stolen, they can't, the transaction can't be reversed. Um, unlike uh, what would happen in a centralized agency, they can just reverse the database, right? So there's a finality to it. So that's both a good thing and a bad thing. So we're saying that Bitcoin is a tool. We're not saying that it's uh, uh, the, uh, the best thing that we're trying to achieve. So Bitcoin is a tool for us to use when it is necessary. And the second thing is about, I think this is more subtle, but it's much more important, is that what underpins the Bitcoin operation is crypto cryptography, is cryptographic key management. Uh, so the key management because it becomes very important. Can you access your wallet and can you access your account? And those keys are very hard to manage. It is not like the password or the username I set. It is a long alphanumerical string, which is known as a private key. So how does an average user know, or how can they know and manage the key themselves? So there must be some sort of wallet providers and stuff like that. But with wallet providers, is another layer of uh, risk. So how are you going to deal with that risk? And so from the company side who started ICO, how are you going to manage the wallet, multi-signature wallet? And what if one of the wallets, one of the uh, signature is lost and stuff like that because you are going to be held responsible for the funds raised. So I think those are the potential issues that using blockchain might face. But with careful planning, those things can be solved. That's how I feel. So as of right now, the ecosystem is in a very positive direction. We have water providers and we also have quite convenient access to our wallets. And for the ICOs, I have not heard of uh, ICO people losing people's funds and stuff like that because we have quite established uh, a set of protocol of how to manage ICOs and funds on the cryptocurrency network, right? And um, so you said that the community was doing some things to prevent these drawbacks, right? Um, what right. are some of these? Um, so what are some of these solutions? Right. So um, I think uh, when it comes to the security aspect, when it comes to the how do we manage the keys, how do we manage the wallet? There's a solution of hot, uh, called hardware wallets. So those things are being reinvented. And also uh, a lot of the servers right now uh, run by the big exchanges are very distributed and they control access to the servers very strictly. So only the ones with the, and they, I think some of them don't even use the conventional authentication method of username and password because that was not secure uh, as mentioned by several articles in the past. So I think the security practice has been advanced right now. And so I think these are the, some of the practices that people use to mitigate the drawbacks. And another way to mitigate the drawbacks is that I have a portfolio uh, balancing when it comes to the crypto asset and my fiat asset. So there's a sort of a hedging over that. 